What you hear him saying is, well, the grounding objection is based upon truth-making theory. And in this form, it's maximal truth-making, that there has to be something that makes something true. And I reject that. And there's all, there's all sorts of reasons not believe this. And I'm like, wait a minute. Every example he gave completely failed because what middle knowledge is saying is that these true subjunctive conditionals, that is what anybody would do in any given circumstance. And I obviously reject that very assumption. Um, mankind is too complex. We don't just live. I do not exist as some essence floating around through space. I am who I am because of the way God made me. I am the result of God's decree. I, as a person, do not pre-exist God's decree. And I personally am offended by the idea that anyone would think that I do. And so no one, including God, can know what someone he has not decreed to make would do in a given situation because my decisions are based upon who I am as an individual and I am God's creature. The gifts he's given me, the gifts he hasn't given me, all determine the range of decisions, but it's always a range of decisions. The idea it's an either A or not A, eat the ice cream, don't eat the ice cream, is, sim is so laughably simplistic. I just, it amazes me that people actually believe this. You know, you can think you know someone better than anybody else on the planet. They will still surprise you. Yeah, but God can really, really, really know you. But that means you do not have the autonomy that the whole system is designed to try to protect in the first place. So I reject that whole idea to begin with. It doesn't make any sense. It's not autonomy. And it really is a very shallow explanation to theodicy, to be perfectly honest with you, that God micromanages everything that happens in the world so that you are always put in a situation where he knows what you're going to do. That's autonomy? That, that somehow answers the problem of evil? I don't think it even gets close to answering the problem of evil. That is the most mechanistic way of answering the, the problem it could ever come up with. But that issue aside, and that's an important issue, that issue aside, I asked Bill Craig, okay, these true subjunctive conditional statements that define middle knowledge upon which God, God's decree is based, that delimit God's decree, they're the Legos from which he creates feasible worlds, not determined by God, right? Nope. That is independent of God's will. They are independent of God's will. Okay? And clearly they can't arise from the creature who has not yet been created, right? Right. So, where do they come from? His answer is, they don't have to come from anywhere. We do not have to answer that question. You are utilizing a theory of truth-making that basically says, you have to answer that question. <laughs> and I'm like, yes, you do have to answer that question because it's the center point of your argument. It's the center point of what you're saying limits God's decree. This is your positive assertion. And you will listen to that program and you will never find out where it comes from. What you will hear is that it's silly to ask the question. And I just, I just go, okay, there you go. For me, there you go. He admits, no, the middle knowledge isn't taught in the Bible. It's a, it's a fruitful uh, system you, you interpret the Bible by. It's consistent with Scripture. It's not taught in the Bible. That's silly. Right. There's the point. God's complete freedom to do with his creation as he sees fit is. And I was stunned at how many times Bill said, there's all sorts of stuff in Reformed theology. It's not taught in Scripture, like God's simplicity or his timelessness. And I'm sitting here going... But I'm sorry. Um, yes, it is. No, there's no explicit statement. I said, look, 
You start in Isaiah 40, you go, go through Isaiah 48, you're telling me you're not going to come up with pretty much all the attributes of God in God's challenging of the false gods to do the things only he can do? And I just, God bless him, I just don't think that, that Bill has spent much time with anybody who even... Is it just seems like he is in in a realm where I mean just remember his debate with Christopher Hitchens? What Christians do disagree with? Well, um, Calvinism. <laughs> and when he describes Calvinism, remember when he tried to review Cy Ten Bruggenkate's stuff on presuppositional apologetics? He clearly does not believe that reformed theologians have anything meaningful to say. So he doesn't read us, or if he does read us, he reads us so shallowly and with, with so little respect for the Reformed tradition that, that it's just like, and so it, there were just times where it just seemed like, like there was, that's where the disconnect was. And that's not the first time I run into it. Not the first time I run into it at all. Um, so, uh, we did get into the supposed um, conditional that, interestingly enough, is a text I've used a number of times when Paul writes to the Corinthians about if the rulers of this age had known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And of course, primary application we use in the past in that crucified Lord of glory, two natures, one person, et cetera, et cetera, which uh, Bill actually doesn't uh, believe, but he's a neo-Apollinarian on that, which we didn't get into, but I, I want to know. Which came first, his Neo-Apollinarianism or his Molinism? And did one influence the other? Because I see a connection between the two. But at one point, he, he did say that the whole history of the world is included in the information that God uses up to the point of a person's decision, any decision in a person's life. God's taking into consideration the whole history of the world. And what I wanted to say is, that means none of that can freely flow from God's eutychia. It's all determined, every single bit of it, including all the natural disasters and everything. It's all determined by middle knowledge. Middle knowledge is the driver here. You know, Bill said, oh yes, it's according to the kind intention of his will, but it's not. It's according to the kind intention of the truth value of subjunctive conditionals. The range of what God can choose is extremely small because his primary function is to uh, run all the data, come up with the feasible worlds, and then there's this, the other question is, what is his grand purpose that will then determine which world is going to be actuated? And you you can't answer any of these questions from Scripture. For a system that is supposedly so useful in producing light, it doesn't produce much light. It leaves us without the clarity of Ephesians 1. Um, but my point was, the whole history of the world includes the decree. There's all sorts of stuff. You know, I need to get dinner on the way home. And I've got a pretty good idea what I'm going to do. But there's a bunch of stuff that can get in the way of that. And I just might change my mind. And the point is, God's made me in a certain way. And that is a part of the freedom of the, his expression. But as long as you engage middle knowledge, what man will do becomes the ultimate decider of all these things. Of all these things. It's never an expression of, of God's eutychia. No. Um, not taught in, but is consistent with. That's the idea of Molinism is not taught in Scripture, but it's consistent with Scripture. And that's, you'll hear it at least twice come out. Bill, that's the difference between us. And he just doesn't believe anybody. He said, James, you know, your beliefs aren't derived from Scripture. There is no passage in Scripture that says that God has a unilateral divine decree. I'm like, really? And I, I brought up others. I brought up, briefly, I brought up Psalm 2, but I focused on Ephesians 1. Sorry, he did not exegete that text. Listen for yourself.
Um, so let me see here. Yeah, and, and at one point, he says, you, you know, toward the end, he says, you know, you don't just simply read this stuff out of Scripture. And I didn't say you simply read it out of Scripture. You read Scripture as a whole. You see it as a full divine revelation. It's not some simplistic surface reading. You read it as a whole. And as such, that's where you drive your... your... So, <clears throat> I am, again, very thankful uh, for having had the opportunity to engage this subject. I don't want to um, just drop the subject. I want to uh, finish up some of the uh, useful material is when Bill starts going, okay, if this is true, then what about this? And we've gotten into some of that before uh, in looking at the only wise God. Um, especially the idea, which I did raise, but he didn't want to discuss, that there are certain people that God can never save in any feasible world. And, and just think about what that means. There are people who exist in some fashion that produce this true subjunctive conditional knowledge that by someone's decree, but in fact by no one's decree, could never be saved. Think about what that means. I think that is a fatal objection to Molinism. And I'm going to tell you something. Um, I don't know how many Molinists have ever even contemplated it. There are a lot of Molinists that the only reason they're Molinists is because William Lane Craig told them to be. But the vast majority of Molinists I've ever in interacted with never even considered the ramifications of what this stuff means. Never. I'm hoping they'll have to now. I'm hoping they'll have to now. No two ways about it. Um, there's going to be a lot of discussion going on. And don't, don't be deterred from the central issue. If you want to be a philosophical Molinist and never make application to theology, fine, go do your thing. It's irrelevant to me. But the only reason Molina came up with what Molina came up with was to undercut the gospel of grace. That's what he was doing. He was defending the continued existence and necessity and centrality of the Roman Catholic sacramental system. That's what it was about. Now, Bill is not defending the Roman Catholic sacramental system, but he's still defending the synergism that is central to that. And don't be taken off of the central issue here by, well, you need to read this book over here, or this guy over here said that, or, you know, Bill Craig isn't really, you know, Justin said more than once, hey, Bill's the primary person pushing this perspective. It seems to be. And I'm, I'm aware of McGregor, and I'm aware of Stratton, but they don't seem to be willing to be quite as full in the claims they're making about this central issue, because it was Bill Craig who voluntarily gave us this quote at the end of the debate with Paul Helm. He knows this is what the Calvinist finds objectionable. He knows where it is. He knows what the issue is. And I'm just hoping that everyone's going to listen to this and go, well, all this truth-making stuff, um, you are saying that there is true truth value to these statements, and then you are saying that it is true that these then delimit God's decree and determine the range of feasible worlds. So this is central to your entire cosmology. And you're saying that the only answer you're going to give as to where it comes from is that you don't have to know? Is it just a brute fact? It just is? 
I mean, is the central aspect of Molinism mystery? Um, rather than the autonomy of God's will? I'll take the autonomy of God's will. Okay? And, and I trust the Spirit of God will enlighten others to do the same thing. That, that was the whole point.